It's a great honor for us to have with us today, Professor Jan Kregel, who's an eminent post-Canadian economist. He's director of uh, Levy Economic Institute of Bard College. He holds the position of Professor of Development Finance at Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, Professor Kregel has been uh, at the helm of uh, studying and uh, uh, sort of policy making regarding the architecture of global economic system and the global financial system in particular. He served as the rapporteur of the Commission on Reform of the International Financial System set up by the president of the UN General Assembly. He has direct, been director of the policy analysis and development branch of the UN Financing for Development Office. He has been deputy secretary of the uh, UN Committee of Exports on International Cooperation in Tax Matters, and so on. So, so the list really goes on. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have you with us, Professor Kregel. Uh, the way our lecture goes, we would uh, uh, the, like you to take about 40, 45 minutes. Uh, our audience join the lecture over a YouTube stream and uh, uh, they would pose questions for you on a chat there. Uh, this lecture is actually going to be moderated by Professor Joyati Ghosh, who's going to join us in a bit because she was herself giving another lecture, which is supposed to get over at 5.30. So as soon as she gets free from there, she is going to join in and take over from me as the moderator of this session. And she'll be there during the question answer sessions to to also uh, discuss with Jan the issues that come up. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to hand over the floor to Professor Kagan. Okay, thank you very much, Vikas. You, you can hear me well? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Now, I just will start out by saying that I really have not entered into any sort of, as I say, public statements at all on, uh, on the pandemic or anything else. Basically, because this is, from my point of view, I don't think uh, this has been a very sensible response by most economists. And we've tended to miss the way in which alternative theories or alternative approaches might have been able to handle uh, the response to the crisis a little bit better. Now, the first point that I would like to make is that obviously I'm here in the United States so that I'm looking primarily at the kind of response that, uh, that we got in the US relative to the response that was taken in China. And then subsequently, uh, I'll try to talk a little bit about the impact that the U.S. response has for uh, for responses in the rest of the world as the pandemic moves into uh, a more global state. So if you go back and listen to the first responses, all of the uh, news programs into first interviewed an economist, say, okay, what is what is going to be the impact? And what did they do? Well, obviously, you're an economist. You pull out supply and demand. And the response, first response was, well, China is in difficulty. China has got a lockdown. Uh, so we have a supply side problem. So what's going to happen is that we're going to have our global production chains that might be disrupted. Uh, we're going to have a reduction in supply. And that reduction in supply is going to create provisioning difficulties. We're probably going to have some adjustments in prices. Well, it's not international then, all of a sudden, what you had was the idea that, well, also we're going to have some impact in the U.S. Uh, I was just getting then to this to the second part of the response. Okay, so the, the next set of interviews, the economists would say, well, if in fact we do have some sort of a shutdown, we now have a demand problem. So this is really going to be something terrible. We're going to have a supply problem and a demand problem. So you can say. Traditionally, this was the standard economist response. They trot out your supply and demand and try to analyze it from, from that particular point of view. Now, if you were looking at 
uh, and alternative approach, what would be the first one? Well, I don't know. The thing which struck me, and you will probably not be surprised, was in terms of looking how people respond to uncertainty. Okay? This was a, a clear case of absolute, complete, and total uncertainty. Okay? We had absolutely no idea what this virus was. We had no idea what the impact was going to be. And to say that somehow or other, you could trot out supply and demand and say that this was going to give you some sort of sensible argument about what was going to happen, I thought was just completely ridiculous. So the first thing to do is to say, okay, if we're faced with a situation of uncertainty like this, what does it tell us? And it's interesting that the first response was always what? Well, the first response is you go back to something that you know. Okay, if you look, Keynes will tell you that if you don't know what's going to happen, you look at what happened yesterday, and that's your best estimate of what's going to happen. So what did we do? We looked at SARS, and we looked at MERS. And the first response was, well, we know that SARS eventually died on its own. It would go away. So the first sort of response that we got was to say, okay, we really don't have to be too concerned about this, because eventually it's going to going to die. You're not going to have a, a great deal of uh, morbidity which is associated with it because again we look at SARS and MERS, the death rates were relatively were relatively small. And in the end, he said, well, do we need a vaccine? And the argument was, well, you know, we had vaccines that we're working on with SARS and MERS, but we never really used them at all. So we really don't need them. So basically, the first response was, was to this was, okay, we really don't need to do very much about it. Then what happened? Well, then it happened that the transmission rate turned out to be much, much higher than it was in terms of either of these previous two cases. And people started to rethink. They said, okay, now we, we have to look at some sort, of, some sort of clear information. And at that stage, finally, everybody started looking at the data. That, okay, let's see how rapidly this is going. Everybody focused on China, and we saw that the Chinese data, first of all, was very disturbing because the transmission rates, the same as uh, R0 rates, were substantially higher than one. In some cases, we had people who were saying that the R0 was as high as five. Uh, an R0 at high as five says that this thing is going to expand to the entire population in the space of about three months uh, if you don't do something about it. The second was that we discovered that you had a symptomatic contagion, which meant that for almost all of the previous cases, you knew that you had some sort of viral infection uh, in the lungs and you had symptoms. So you could clearly tell just exactly who was sick and who wasn't. But in this case, we, we discovered that the primary contagion was in fact occurring before you knew that anybody was sick. Now, this meant that your R0 figures meant absolutely nothing. They were zero. You had no idea how rapidly this, uh, this virus was going to spread into the population. So the next thing that we did was to look at, at models. And we said, okay, now we're going to model this thing. Now, as we know, the models depend on what? The models depend on being able to identify just exactly who is sick and how rapidly it's passed. And we just said that once you have asymptomatic contagion, your R0 figures, which are the basis of all of these models, are absolutely worthless. So we had five, six, seven, eight different models, all of them coming up with different numbers. In the case of that, we, as I said, we started out with complete and total uncertainty, and you ended up with complete and total uncertainty. So that the, somehow or other, the idea that there was nothing that you could do, that nothing, you know, you didn't have to do anything quickly, very quickly went out the window. And what was the response? Well, the only response that you could do was the Chinese response, is that you shut down. Because in the absence of any information, if you don't know how the thing passes, but you do know, that there is contagion, direct one-to-one -one contagion by individuals who are, uh, who are ill, then you have to go into what, well, we, what we now call social distancing, okay? Basically locked out. And this was the only possible, uh, the only possible response. 
Now, China did it. And China is really the only one so far, I think, that has done this with extremely seriously. In terms of in terms of the U.S., we certainly have not done this. Right? We have a sort of 50-50 uh, lockdown. But if you look then at the the I would say the, the rational response to uncertainty, which was the one that you had in China, complete lockdown, and we now go back to the uh, go back to the Economist. And look at the uh, the comments that you got after it became very very clear that the only rational response was a lockdown. Was people saying, "Well, just exactly how bad is the recession going to be?" And you sort of scratch your head and you say, "Recession? I mean, this is not a recession. If you have a lockdown, what you do is you shut down the economy. This is not a recession." in the sense that you have a, a, a reduction in aggregate demand or you have a reduction in government spending or anything else uh, of that sort of thing. So the question is now, you had the question, what is the estimate of the fall in GDP? Oh, well, I really don't know. I have to look at my model. Well, your model is not gonna tell you anything because you have absolutely no idea what it's going to be. Basically, if you wanted to get some sort of estimate, now, you could have gotten a reasonably good estimate, and that was look at who are considered to be essential workers, who are considered to be non-essential workers, and who can work from home. In the U.S., we have the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which gives you very good numbers on this, and you can calculate just exactly who is going to become unemployed. You can calculate what their average income is, and you can calculate just exactly how much income is going to fall if in fact you do introduce a complete and total lockdown, okay? So it wasn't a, it wasn't a question of looking at how much employment, unemployment is going to go up or down or estimating this or that. You could have come up with a very, very good estimate of this. The only thing that you really didn't know was how long this was going to last, okay? You could tell really very, very clearly what the net loss in terms of individual income be. So from that point of view, again, you've got the, you know, the standard economist response, how much is demand going to go up or down? No, all you had to do was to look at the numbers and you got a very, very good figure on what it was going to be. Now, China gave us a, uh, an indication and that indication was that this is going to last about two to three months before we're going to be in a position to reopen. If you look at what happened in Wuhan, uh, you started the end of January and sometime around the end of uh, March, the beginning of April. The figures look reasonable. So in this particular case, it said, if you do a serious job, you've got two or three months. I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna you lose basically something a little less than a quarter of GDP if we do this in the right way. And we also know just exactly what the, what the unemployment figures are going to be, okay? So that, says to you what you know, what would the the the, normal, the the alternative response alternative theory response to the crisis have been that is you could have produced a reasonably good prediction now the question is just exactly what are you going to do then okay and again what did we get we said well we need stimulus you sort of scratch your head and you say well just a minute if i'm sending all these people home okay and they're not going home because they're they lack demand for their for their services. They're going home because we have to send them home. Uh, what do we stimulate? I mean, really, there's no possibility to. We don't want stimulus. We want all these people to go home and not do anything. We want them to sit. I mean, basically, the idea is that people are supposed to not do anything. So why in the world are we worried about stimulus? We can't stimulate. There's no stimulating way out of this. The only way you get out of it is what? You get out of it by stopping the spread of the virus. So again, we have this problem. What is your objective here? Well, the objective is to try and get employment and GDP back up to where it was. No, that's not what we want to do. What we want to do is to make sure that the virus is dead. That is your objective. So if you're going to do something, you do something to make sure that it's easier and quicker to stop that. So standard, I said, standard response stimulus. No, stimulus doesn't work. Other standard response. Okay, we have the example of Roosevelt in the New Deal. We're going to give people jobs. 
no, we can't do that because giving people jobs is precisely the wrong thing. That's the thing that we don't want to do. Okay, we want people to stay home. So you can say, well, maybe what we should be doing, okay, maybe we should have pay people to stay home. Maybe their job is not going out. And now the question comes just exactly, you know, sort of how do we do that? And the question is, everybody said, well, everybody's losing their incomes. We have to replace their income so that they have their money. And again, I listen to this, I scratch my head. And I say, I'm sitting here at home. I don't have, you know, I'm not supposed to be spending on anything. I'm not supposed to be going out. What do I need my income for? My income is totally useless to me. Okay. So what do we do? I say, well, obviously, we really don't have to replace everybody's income. What do we have to do? Well, we have to make sure that everybody manages to survive. How do we do that? Well, we have social support programs, okay? We have food support programs in the US, okay? So the first thing um, from the alternative point of view is to say we wanna make sure that if everybody stays home, okay, they have enough to nourish themselves and they have enough to do it well. So the first thing we probably, well, let's say I would have looked at is the food supply system. That is, we have a system in the US which is called SNAP, which provides, uh, uh, provide food support benefits. Let's say the first thing to do, instead of running around trying to support everybody's income, let's make sure that everybody has enough to eat by organizing the SNAP program so it applies basically to everybody. Okay. Now, that program is going to work how? Well, it's going to work by organizing, and here Roosevelt does come into some sensible uh, proposal. You're going to need an organization, a, some sort of civilian conservation corps, which is going to be a civilian food corps to make sure that everybody has enough to eat. Now, we have very quickly discovered that if you shut down uh, restaurants, that you have all sorts of food that goes to waste. Okay? The rest of, restaurants have been shut down for two months. Okay? It was only about two weeks ago that the state of New York set up a program of taking the food that the farmers could no longer sell and who were simply trashing, that is, they were simply destroying all of this stuff and creating a system to circulate this to people who don't have enough to eat, okay? So there was a possibility of looking at this thing in terms of you know, providing a minimum subsistence to everybody. Now, the other side of that was what? Well, the other side is the program that we actually got was to do what? Was to support employment and incomes by giving money to employers. Now, that was probably the worst thing that you could possibly do because you were giving money to employers, number one, to employ people that they didn't want to produce anything because they couldn't sell anything. And number two, it was going to come in terms of an increase in their debt with the possibility of a short write-off. Now, why in the world would you want to do that? I mean, if you were going to support income, it would have been much easier to say, ah, I know that this is an economy that, again, if we look at this from a uh, stock flow basis, we know that employers have expenses. Labor is one of those expenses. Well, if you're not paying labor, okay, if labor is being laid off and you're supporting labor by terms of a direct program of providing food subsistence, then the employers don't need the money in order to pay the workers that they don't want. Now, this leaves, let me say, on a simple basis, this is, these are the flow costs, okay? We could have simply decided to stop all the flow costs, okay? Everybody's cost is somebody else's income. If we stopped all of them, right, then we don't have to give anybody money to cover those costs. It's the fixed costs that we have to take care of. And the fixed costs we take care of by doing what? Well, we have a moratorium on mortgage payments. We have a moratorium on, basically, if you think of this in terms of capital and labor, okay? The shutdown said, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce labor incomes to subsistence so that people can survive. What happens to capital income? They say, well, capital incomes have to share in this. So that if we've decided that We've, got that. We've done this calculation about one third of, or sorry, one quarter to one third of GDP is going to disappear. Then the capital values of everybody, one third is going to disappear. 
So what do we do? We shut down the stock exchange, number one. Number two, we shut down the incomes of all administrative and management personnel in the company. Okay? They also now go down to subsistence and they're going to lose one quarter to one third of the capital value of the institution. Okay? And that's the way we try and share equitably the cost of the shutdown. Okay? Now, basically what this would mean is that the government would not have to spend a great deal of money. The government would have to do what? The government would have to engage in a certain amount of organization. And we're now back to the Roosevelt administration. That is, the first 100 days of the Roosevelt administration managed to organize okay, all of these employment programs. Okay? We look at the fact that they created jobs and they created income. But the important point is that they managed to set up the organization and management of these programs in record time. Okay? And that's the thing that the government could not do. Okay? What we needed in this case was not government money. Okay? We didn't need the government to spend a great deal in order to solve this problem. What we needed was to get the government to provide an equitable means of sharing the losses and to make sure that particular areas didn't pay a higher price than others. Now, obviously, when we did the 2008, 2000, uh, 2007, 2008 crisis, there we did have a great deal of inequity. Everybody knows we bailed out the banks, we bailed out the management of the corporation, we let the workers lose their houses. This time, we were supposed to do it differently, but we didn't. We didn't do it differently at all. The criticisms that we have in the US of the programs are simply all of these programs went to support the banks, they went to support, well, they'll get into the airline. Why in the world are we flying empty airplanes? Okay, we're flying empty airplanes in order to support, presumably, the jobs of the people who work in the airline, but they've been laid off already. So the planes are flying empty back and forth. These corporations are losing massive amounts of money because in order to access government support, they have to fly the airplane. Okay, this is just totally absurd. What we're doing is just increasing indebtedness, right, left, and sideways, without satisfying what I say. What is, what is our basic objective? And that basic objective is to get the virus dead, to get it to stop. And the only, we know the only way to stop that is by everybody sitting at home doing nothing. Now, this would have, as I say, this would have been the, the first rational response to somebody who starts out by looking and saying, we don't know what's happening. The only possibility that we have is more or less to shut down the economy for one quarter and to try and create an equitable distribution of the cost of that shutdown. Okay, the, the cost could have been relatively easily, uh, relatively easily done. Now, obviously, this would have represented what? Well, we heard people talking about war economy. Okay, yeah, the war economy, we did that. We had rationing in the war economy. We had people who moved, were forcibly moved into doing things, that is, working in munitions plants and so forth. Well, here we were moving people into doing nothing, except for those who were, and this kind of brings me to my last element in the story, those people who were essential, okay? And then we have these essential workers. The essential workers are what? These are the people who were working in the hospitals, the doctors, the nurses, the support staff, the people who were providing for, uh, uh, for basic subsistence for the rest of the population. And this is what basically needed to be organized. And this is the one thing that was not organized at all. Again, it was left to the market is everybody was left to try and buy in and support whatever they could. If you have ever seen a better example of the fact that the market cannot work in these sorts of cases, this is it, okay? We managed not to provide the basic support services that we needed, okay, for those essential workers in order to respond to those people who in fact did become sick. And this is probably, again, the greatest failing in the organization. The, uh, the argument. This was not a question of money. Okay, we had all the money that you wanted in order to, in order to do this. It was a question of being able to organize appropriately, and the organization required some sort of, as we said before, some sort of war economy, some sort of centralized uh, centralized activity. So 
so we're now in the case in, in which we're saying, okay, we did this sort of halfway. We have no idea exactly how we're going to get out of it. Okay, because because what? Well, because you've got half the country who's complaining that they are quarantined. There's most of them still getting paid. You know, you read in the newspapers, people don't go back, don't want to go back to work. And one side of the argument is, well, we don't want to go back to work because our unemployment benefit is higher than my wage. Well, the problem then maybe is not the unemployment benefit. The problem maybe is the wage that in order to get these essential workers to go back to work, maybe we should increase their wages. That's now, one probably good good example. Instead, what do we get? Instead, we get the argument which says, "Well, we should we should be producing everything in the U.S." Okay, the problem was that we were producing everything in China, and if we stop producing in China and produce in the U.S., we're going to solve all these problems. No, this is not going to solve the problem because if the market had worked, we could have solved the problem, and we find every day examples of the possibility that we could have produced domestically the things that we needed, but the lack of organization simply prevented this, uh, prevented, this from, uh, prevented this from happening. So if you say, okay, now what have, what have we got as a result of this? Well, as a result of this, we're going to have a, a very massive increase in government debt. Is this a problem? Well, yes and no. We all know that it really doesn't make that much difference but there is a very big downside to this. And that downside turns out to be not directly economic. It turns out to be political because we know that every time the government runs up a very large deficit which increases the debt, that there is a political response. And my friends on the left who say, well, you know, we have now won the battle. The government can spend anything it wants. MMT rules. No, it does not rule because the backlash has already started. What's going to happen is that the Congress is going to come in and say, we now have to cut all sorts of, all sorts of essential services, which are precisely the things that we needed in order to respond to the crisis. That's the federal level. We look at the state level, state governments run on a legally imposed balanced budget principle, okay? New York State has is going to have a budget deficit, which is well, simply impossible to calculate. Okay, and the response is going to be that it's going to have to cut expenditures. Now, state government expenditures are what? Again, state government expenditures are virtually all what we consider to be essential workers. Okay, this is school, this is security, this is Medicare, this is education the basics that we need in order to respond. And these are the things which are, going, which are going to be cut as a result of this. And this is why, I go back to my other argument, it would have been much better to try and resolve this entire thing, not by increasing expenditures, the things that we really didn't need, did not in the end, did not provide, but providing a more direct support through the local government is back to the question of organization, it turns out that local government, or sorry, state governments in this case, turned out to be much better at providing the organization which was required in order to respond to the crisis than the federal government. But in the end, what we're going to find is that the reduction in federal government expenditures is going to feed through to the reduction in the transfers from the federal government to the state government, and the state governments are then going to cut. So if we're looking at this idea of you know, what happens afterwards if we, all, if we all go back to work, okay? This is not a question of uh, finding the correct way to open up businesses by social distancing and everything else. This is the problem of finding a way to resolve the problem that the increased debt burden is going to place on state government expenditures for essential workers. So if you say you know, we had all of these non-essential workers who were sent home in order to kill the virus, became forcibly unemployed. Afterwards, it's all the essential workers who are going to become unemployed because state governments will not have the money to, uh, to employ them anymore. So if you look at the, the school budgets already, you're looking at very sharp reductions in, uh, in school budgets. 
at precisely the time when people are talking about, well, if we open up the schools, we're going to need classrooms that are twice as big, we're going to need twice as many teachers, we're going to need twice as many this, as twice as many that, in order to open the schools before we are able to have a adequate response to the uh, uh, the contagion rate of the, of the virus. Now, again, this goes back, this is sort of catch-22. Now, you can have one or you can have the other, but you can't have both. Okay? So this is this is sort of I say my uh, my response to what to what has been happening, and basically the reason why I haven't said anything about it because number one it just seems so ridiculous the way things have been handled, but at the same time this is probably the only kind of political response that we could have gotten that is the way the uh, political system is set up in order to look at the market as the only response to the problem and to say that the government should get out of the way and let the private market respond, effectively what has happened is that you've gotten this you know, very, very clear demonstration of market failure and people are hopefully noticing that any sort of rational response that we got came in terms of the organizational abilities of state governments, state and local governments which were the ones who in fact did uh, provide some sort of response. Now, as I said, this is very, very much from the, from the experience of the, uh, of the United States and the way we've looked at this particular problem. Other countries have gone about this in, uh, in a number of different ways. As I said, I really don't see, given the, uh, the uncertainty around the reproduction rates of the, uh, of the virus, that you could have possibly responded in any, really in any other way, other than doing a, uh, a direct shutdown. Now, of course, some of you say, well, there was, a, there was an alternative. The alternative was what? Well, the alternative was having listened to the multiple uh, uh, medical forecasts and reports that indicated after the SARS crisis, that there would be another one. And we know that there were detailed plans that existed in the uh, WHO, that existed in the US government and in other places of a rapid response, okay? Now, my only response to this is that there was still this difficulty that even if those plans had been uh, active, the difficulty in rapidly identifying the ability of this particular virus to spread the contagion rate. And secondly, the fact that it produces all sorts of uh, symptoms that could not have been initially initially predicted. That is, for example, in the US, we had the, 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 the idea that since this is something like SARS, we needed ventilators. And we had this ventilator crisis. And then we discovered that ventilators were killing people rather than saving them because the uh, infection of the lungs was, it was not the standard uh, pneumonia. It was a very different response in the lungs. And it was uh, probably inappropriate to have been putting everybody on ventilators. At one, at one stage, uh, we had predictions which said that if, you know, if you see anybody going intubation onto a ventilator, that there was an 85% chance that they would die within a week. Now, why was that? It's not because they were sick, it's because it was the wrong treatment. And we then discovered that it was not only the wrong treatment, but that a large proportion of the, of the people who did not have uh, respiratory problems had kidney failure. And we then had the crisis in dialysis machines. And again, this is something that, you know, the, be the best plans that you can set up cannot predict this sort of problem. So, we then had the crisis of the dialysis machine. And then after that, we discovered what? We discovered people were dying of heart attacks. Well, what is this? These are people who had preconditions. No, it's not that they had preconditions. It's that the virus, in fact, increases the ability of the blood to clot. And it was the blood clotting that was starting to kill people. So in these particular cases, in which you have, as I said, absolutely complete uncertainty in terms of the way the illness can be uh, identified, and the way that it can be treated, the best plans in the world would never have uh, would never have been able to prepare you for this uh, for this sort of activity. The most recent thing is that last week 
uh, young children who up until this stage had been considered to be relatively immune, that is that they were going to have either uh, very mild cases or would in fact recover on an asymptomatic basis, in fact have produced some sort of mysterious disease which is killing them that has still not yet been identified. But these are all people, all young children who had been confirmed positive for uh, COVID-19 uh, in the past. So again, this is one of these un unforeseen symptoms and results of this particular uh, of this particular virus. So we're back to that. You know, to that position, which said that really the only the only way we had to kill this was to in fact try as much as possible is to prevent the trans uh, to prevent the transmission. Now, I said that eventually we would want to look at the impact of this on uh, uh, on the rest of the world, and obviously the first one is that whether you are you know, supporter or not supporter. Of, uh, of globalization or anything else, the decline in the ability of multilateral institutions to respond to this crisis has, has really been very, very jarring. And it's one of the things that presumably everybody who talks about globalization says that really this indicates the need for some sort of global governance or global something else. Well, this global governance simply was not there. Now, part of this obviously is due to the fact of the US government to withdraw from uh, support of many of these agencies, but even on the basis of the European Union and other uh, regional organizations, the kind of response that one would have expected as coming close to some sort of global response has been really very, very, uh, very, very disappointing. Because quite obviously, this is one one case in which, or probably the best case in which, some sort of global response would have been much more uh, much more relevant. The second is the fact that once again, what we've done is to somehow or other engineer the response so that the largest cost is borne by labor number one and minority groups amongst the labor force. I mean, this is this is sort of you know, you, you could not have imagined this after the 2007-2008 uh, crisis. Is that the response could have been even worse? And if you look in the U.S., you know, if you look at death rates, death rates as a result of the crisis for those people who are considered to be essential workers are the highest amongst Latinos and uh, and black minority populations. So that basically the cost is being borne, number one, by those people who continue to be required to work, and number two, in general, by those people who do not have the ability to, in any sense, defend themselves uh, against this sort, of, uh, this sort of activity. But the stock market, we left open. The management salaries determined by stock options continue to be paid. Okay? So all the crisis has done is to reinforce the kind of inequality that we already had going into the crisis. And what would have been a possibility of trying to at least taking one step to remedy this, uh, this deficiency simply sort of completely fell off the map. And on, again, on this very strange sort of argument is that we're defending the workers by giving corporations the money to guarantee their wages over a period of time. And as I said, to me, this seems to be, this seems to be the most illogical way to respond and not providing any sort of, uh, any sort of response to the activity or to the uh, inequity that was built into this sort of system. So the, I think the, the first, I mean, it, we said before we're talking in a war economy. Now, in the in a war economy, you do close the stock market. That does happen. Okay, 1914, the British market was closed, shut down. You you do have the ability to have an equitable distribution of the cost uh, of this particular of this particular market. So now we end up finding that 
all, all of the congressmen who knew that the, the, the shutdown was coming all went out very quickly and sold the stocks in the transportation industries and everything else and bought stocks in the, in the health industry and made lots of money. Say, okay, well, that's fine. If we had simply shut down these markets, then that would not have happened. That could not have happened. But again, that was probably one bridge, uh, one bridge too far in terms of the in terms of the response. So as I said, the last, the last part of this thing are international capital markets. Okay, international capital markets are also functioning reasonably well, which means what? They're functioning reasonably well, which means that everybody is moving their money back from developing country markets into the developed country markets, and particularly into the U.S. market, which is presumably one of the reasons why the U.S. stock market continues to do as well as uh, as well as it does. And at the same time, places this incredible uh, incredible burden on monetary authorities in countries, in which they believe that their only response is to do what? Their only response is, is to reduce interest rates. Now, I really don't see how a reduction in interest rates does anything at all to support our response to the, uh, to the pandemic crisis. It simply means that if, now, if people want to borrow money to speculate, they can do it much more cheaply than they ever could before. Part of the argument is that government debt is much cheaper than it was before, so it's a little bit easier to spend. But as we said before, this is not a crisis in which you need to spend. This is a crisis in which... You need to make sure that people do not starve to death while they sit at home until we stop the, 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 transmission, the transmission of the virus. And so if you come to the, now you say the bottom line, the bottom line is that everybody says, well, now we need to test and we need to trace. Well, if we need to test and we need to trace, we have all sorts of people we can employ to do tracing. And if we really have to open up, the way that we open up is that we get the people at home to do the tracing. Say, well, tracing, you know, you, they can't do that because you have to go and see. No, you don't have to go and see people. Okay, you just tracing simply means what? Tracing means keeping uh, spreadsheets, it means keeping contact information, and providing that contact information, contacting people. You don't have to go and see them. You don't have to breathe on them. You don't have to do that. So there are types of uh, types of employment for those people who feel that they they really need to be doing something while they're at home uh, that actually provides uh, provides that possibility. So uh, I think I've probably gone on long enough about uh, as I say in terms of what I consider my rant is why why everything that the economists did was absolutely wrong and why everything the government did was absolutely wrong, but. We say, uh, one of our famous politicians said basically, you fight the war with the army that you've got, and we're fighting this war with the politicians that we've got. There's really very little way to avoid that conclusion. Okay, Jati, I'm done. Wow. Yeah, and that was absolutely fascinating. And I have to say, you've kind of stood everything on its head from what we are normally told about this crisis and everything. I mean, that uh, when you said this about the stimulus, and when you say it, it sounds so clear and obvious and plausible and logical. Yet all this time, all of us have been falling for this thing that, oh, you know, and in India, we're not doing enough and et cetera, et cetera. But yes, I, I think uh, that, that was incredibly uh, fascinating. Uh, I think Vikas has collected a bunch of questions, but I, can I just abuse my <laughs> position here to ask you first? You know, the, doesn't isn't this predicated on this thing lasting for a given amount of time? Uh, so that because you can't obviously you know just keep everybody at home indefinitely. So you have to assume that it will be say three months or what two to three months that you keep everybody at home. And then you have got rid of the transmission. But in a sense, in India, we did that. And we did a very brutal lockdown. It's true that they couldn't do physical distancing in the slums and so on. But we did a very, very brutal lockdown. And we've kicked the can down the road. So we didn't actually get rid of the infection or anything. But uh, it's just now you have to open up at some point because you have destroyed everybody's livelihoods. We didn't even pay them or give them food, what you have suggested. We've actually driven people to starvation. But we haven't solved that virus problem either. So I'm just asking, does it mean that you you have to think of a way of 
managing this over i don't know supposing you get waves how are you how are you going to deal with that sort of uncertain scenario where you don't know what will ultimately control it yeah no as i said before the big the big uh, uncertainty of the of the entire uncertainty was what sort of time frame are we talking about and this is why you know i went back to to uh, to china and you say more or less that's the only real information that we have that in the range of two to three months it becomes something that you in fact can deal with okay and this is why at one point everybody talks about testing and tracing okay because testing and tracing says that after you get down to a certain level when you you know your your r figure gets down to something below 0.9 if it gets down to 0 0.5, 0 0.3, I, you know, I can't remember now the, the technical number, at which it becomes feasible to use testing and tracing as a control mechanism. So that once you're at that base, even if you haven't completely uh, eliminated the thing, it's something that you, can, that you can control. You can prevent the outbreaks. Okay? So really what you're doing is you're playing around this R number. So... Your three months says that if in three months I get R down to 0.5, then it's something that I, ca I can live with. I can let people go back because I can tell just exactly what's going to now. Is take the case that we had here of the uh, slaughterhouses. Okay? This was something that you know, basically was waiting to happen. Again, could have been predicted. Now, everybody said, look at the Midwest. They have very low contamination rate because why well in the midwest you, know, you don't have concentration of population you don't have all of these things and my first response was well i've lived in the midwest and i know that every farmer goes to the feed store once a week i know that everybody goes to church once a week i know that everybody goes to church supper once a week and i know that all of the meat packing plants that used to be in chicago are now spread around the farm so i know that probably the contagion in the midwest it's, you know, the absolute size is much lower, but the frequency of interaction is much higher. And lo and behold, two months later, what happens is now New York is, well, I won't say New York is fine, but the rates are declining and the death rates are increasing in the meatpacking plants in the, uh, in the Midwestern states, which is what everybody could have, could have predicted. Now, had we decided ahead of time that these were the places to organize the testing and the tracing, because in New York, you're never going to get testing and tracing. Okay, you've got 8 million people, and you know, this is just something that's never going to happen. On the other hand, when you've got a state which doesn't even have 8 million people, that's something that you could do. Okay, So you could have, in fact, carved out parts of the country mm -hmm. in which you could as I say, dominate the transmission. Mm -hmm. So in that particular case, you, you, know, you still don't know just exactly how long it's going to take because you don't know what the, the decline uh, in the R is going to look like. But again, you look at China and basically it was, it was within two months that they managed to do that, which is you know, why I picked, I said, well, you're looking at about a quarter. You, you presume it's going to be about a quarter of GDP by the time you get everything uh, organized and set up. But no, you're absolutely right. It's not something that, uh, that's going to go, that's presumably going to go away completely. And this is, you know, what's the problem with SARS? SARS died its own death. It mutated itself out of existence. This thing manages to mutate itself into even, you know, increasingly viral form uh, mm -hmm. as it goes on, which is what is really, uh, really scary. Because every week you discover some alternative way in which it manages to kill people, uh, and one of the you know I think the sort of the simplest way to look at it, if you read the the, the medical report, uh, it's not that it just manages to enter uh, through the uh, nasal passages and uh, the ocular orbits through your eyes, but it manages to contaminate any sort of cell covering. So basically, that's where the blood clots come from. It, it attacks the
the blood vessel. And once you're attacking the blood vessels, uh, you know, it can, it can go anywhere. And that's why there's been so much difficulty in trying to target, uh, to target the response. Because if you do, you know, you manage to fix the lungs and then it goes to the kidneys. If you manage to fix the kidneys, it goes to the heart. You manage to go to the heart and, you know, it goes someplace else. So that the, the, the sort of medical response uh, is really very, very difficult. Okay. It's, 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 okay. it's depressing to look at the way this thing moves because it says that, in fact, hospitals are not the things that are going to solve the problem because it keeps moving faster than we can, uh, we can predict how to respond. So it's, it's got to be something that says we have to cut the transmission rate. Wow. Oh my God. That, that was even more depressing than I thought it was. <laughs> but I think Vikas has got a bunch of questions. I'm not able to see them, Vikas. Is there is a way that I can see them? You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, so yeah. there are um, three, let's say, three sets of questions. Uh, questions that pertain to your idea of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, what to do about the economy. Uh, there are uh, some questions about uh, uh, strategies adopted in other countries and the relevance of your proposals in the other contexts. And then there are some questions specifically to the whole uh, sort of health, uh, uh, the sort of health sector and the situation of the essential workers and so on. So let's take the first lot. Uh, uh, now there are three questions here, but if we do not stimulate right now, permanent deflationary trends might set in, which might hinder economic viability once we open up, causing more job losses to vulnerable. How do we deal with that? So that's one question. Then there is another question. What is your view about monetizing the deficit in the short run and taxing the high income people and corporates in the long run as an alternative? And the third question is higher state spending can be matched by higher revenue through tax collection. One situation gets better. Why is the need to maintain balanced budget so daunting to the states? Okay, first question is that I think what we have to do is to look at what will be the long-term impact of the response that we have, okay? If, as Jayati has indicated, the long-term impact is not that this thing disappears, but it remains with us, okay? It means that there are going to be very, very large structural changes that are going to have to take place. And these are things, again, very difficult to predict just exactly what they're going to be. But somehow the idea that by opening up, we go back to doing things the way we did them before, I think is absolutely wrong. That is, everything is, is in a sense, going to be different. Uh, like I said, we've seen quite clearly uh, for those uh, parts of the U.S. that have opened, that some of them, the response has been positive, and in others, the response has been negative, okay? And if you think of this, uh, basically in the large urban areas that rely on public transport, uh, you know, your first response is, okay, I'm gonna go back to work. And you say, okay, I'm gonna go back to work, but I'm gonna get on the bus, and I'm gonna get on the uh, metro, I'm gonna get on the subway. And it's going to be full of all of these people. And I have absolutely no idea what their condition is. Maybe I don't want to do that. Okay. So what am I going to do? Okay. I'm going to go in my car. Well, no, you can't do that. Okay. Because we're going to have to have some sort of control in terms of the separation between public and private, public and private transport. Okay. So that's something which is going to move, going to change. Everybody says, well, now what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that everybody is going to Uber their way to work. No, everybody cannot Uber their way to work because then nobody is going to get to work because the traffic is going to be so bad you can't get there. Okay, this is just a, a banal example of the, the, the kinds of things that are going to come up. So 
I think it's it's really a little bit naive to think that we're just going to you know, we just you know, sort of as well as our as the governor of New York State likes to say it's not just you know throwing the switch and then suddenly it's sort of as as if we have been watching the bad movie and the bad movie is gone and we're going to go back to doing things the way we did before. It's not that's not the way uh, not the way it's going to happen. Uh, so that's the 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 first one. Uh, in terms of the second two questions, both of these presume that there is some sort of financial way to resolve this problem. Okay, and as I said before, I don't see this as something as the financial problem. This is a you know, it's difficult to uh, provide examples. Okay, the one example that would come to mind is the 1973 and the petroleum crisis. Okay. This was a, a net transfer of income from one set of country to another set of countries. Okay. Now, this case is not a net transfer of income. This is just a, they're gone. Okay. That income is gone. The output is gone. The income is gone. Everything is gone. And it's the question of how, in, how to redistribute that deadweight loss equitably across the population during the time it occurs and afterwards okay so it's not a question of you know we can we can make people whole we can make them good you're never going to get this back okay this is three months of output that is not there and you're not going to get it now if you're a good neoclassical economist you believe that the economy always goes back to its natural trend growth rate and it's going to come back sometime in the future well if that's the case then you know, you can create some sort of future bond in which you say, okay, you get a little bad. So it says, I stayed home and I have the right to recover my lost income for three months whenever it comes back again. Okay. And that's something that, yes, you can take place in terms of, uh, in terms of taxes and, uh, taxes and revenue. Okay. Very similar thing. If you look at, uh, World War II, we had this idea of deferred income. Part of Keynes' how to, play to, how to pay for the war plan was deferring consumption expenditure. Okay? But the difference there was that, in fact, people were actually working in the munitions plant. Okay? The income stayed. The output disappeared. Presumably, it was blown up. The planes got shot down and the bullets got used. Okay? But the idea was that you would eventually get your money back. In the U.S., we had this idea of uh, savings bonds. A uh, good friend of mine has just sent me a, a clip from uh, the 1950s where Mr. Ed, the talking horse, has a commercial to convince people to buy U.S. savings bonds. Okay? That's one possibility. We could give everybody a U.S. savings bond, which is equivalent to their lost income. And then, you know, then we'll pay it. You know, eventually, we'll pay it back. But that's something you don't know. Okay? Whether output is this output is going to be recovered or not, you have absolutely no, absolutely no idea. Okay. So my first response is to say, what we what we should be trying to do is to equitably distribute that loss, not worrying about trying to compensate for it, because in the short term you cannot compensate for it. Okay. You can't get it back. It's gone. Uh, and this is this, uh, this somehow this idea that somehow or other you can move these things through time. You can get it back if you wait on No, you don't. No. Eventually may come back, eventually it may not. So, as I say, I'm very skeptical about these arguments. The other, in terms of the state government, yeah, in terms of the state government, this is the problem of getting that tax income back. But the problem is that that tax income is gone. Okay, it's not going to come back. You're going to recover. Yeah, maybe the state governments go back into uh, back into budget balance, but they still have the hole that was created by the fact that they, the states, were the ones that engaged in the major expenditures for uh, the health sector. Okay, virtually every. I mean, this is this is the case. Uh, in the U.S., which is I recognize different from it is from it is in a number of other countries, but it was the state governments that had to go out and buy the ventilators and create the hospital beds and spend the money on the PPE in order to uh, 
in order to allow the nurses and uh, the orderly to protect themselves uh, from infection. So all of this stuff is sitting on state budgets as government, as what will eventually be, and again, it's not even at this stage government, it's not even even state debt because it's simply there, okay? The expenditures are there. They haven't issued the bonds yet in order to cover and legally the, that loss has to be uh, has to be covered by the issue of state debt. So this is this is not a thing in which simply you know, revving the economy back up to full employment is going to solve that problem for the, uh, for the state government. And this is, this is not a new problem. I mean, if you go back to the Depression, the figures that are produced for deficit expenditures in the U.S. are usually the figures for the federal government. When you include the state government figures, the state governments were all in surplus. That is, they were all cutting expenditures because they were relatively low. So that in fact, the net government surplus during the Depression was only mildly positive when you take into account the fact that the state governments were going against the, uh, against the grain. They were cutting back expenditures simply because they didn't have the money to do that. Now, many states have the so-called rainy day fund that is after uh, 2008. They put money aside, but this uh, you know, the size of these rainy day funds relative to the expenditures that uh, have been incurred are very, very, uh, very, very small. So it's really not a case that the state governments are going to, you know, going to be back in terms of fiscal health, which is why all of the state governors, well, not all of them, but the ones that have had the major expenditures, are now petitioning Congress in order to include state government support in the next federal uh, federal bill to respond uh, to respond to the, to the virus. Now, each of them, we've had three of these so far. Each one of them has promised support for the state, and so far none of them have included it. Basically, because most of the states that have the majority of the expenditures happen to be states with Democratic governors, and the Senate happens to be held by the Republicans, so the Republicans have refused to approve any, uh, any support measures with, with state, uh, state government. So their argument is that if we make it really bad for these Democratic governors, then maybe they'll lose the next election and they'll be replaced by Republican governors. All right. Uh, there are, Jan, there are uh, several questions uh, about the relevance of these proposals and in the context outside the US. Uh, let me take a few of those and then uh, maybe we can have one more installment. Uh, so there's one question. Is it possible for governments which have followed neoliberal policies and let the private sector and markets deal with production and supply of all kinds of goods and services uh, to suddenly have the capacity to organize food distribution uh, in in the way that you have you have suggested, the uh, second question is: In the context of developing countries, are you arguing that none of the post-Canadian response is desirable as an economic response? Uh, MMT, job guarantee, basic income, and this uh, person has in mind uh, Wall Street Journal's recent editorial claims that we are a modern we are modern monetary theorists now. Uh, then there is a question. India seems to be in a situation where a move away from the objective of curbing the virus to a move towards saving livelihood seems urgent. In this case, how does the alternative work? To this, in fact, I was thinking if I could add, you know, I mean, in a context in which, uh, you know, uh, what you, you said, Somewhere uh, there is an assumption that uh, a large part of incomes of people is not for subsistence consumption. So, you know, if you could just reduce everything down to uh, covering their subsistence, you could you you could just manage for a few few say a certain uh, period of time. What would happen in a context in which 
a substantial part of consumption of a vast majority of people goes for subsistence goods, either food or even other things which they can't last very long without replacing, you know, I mean, their clothes, their, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, supplies. And in fact, the production sector, the, the production in the economy is also a large part of production is of goods that actually just go into the consumption of, of people. How would this work in that kind of context? Over to you. Okay, to respond to the first one, uh, when I mentioned the response to the, the, the Roosevelt response to the depression, we have this tendency to look at the employment creation aspect. But as I mentioned, the other thing was the organizational aspect. That is that they managed to set up these programs extremely rapidly. Okay? Now, the argument is always that fiscal, you know, fiscal expenditure policy takes a long time because it takes a lot of planning. Yes, it does. But the organizational part okay, can be done relatively rapidly. So again, the problem is not so much that can you do the organization or not. The question is, do you have the appropriate government? In the U.S., we went from the Hoover administration, okay, which was not antagonistic to government programs, but was unwilling okay, to take the steps which were required to implement these programs on a full federal basis. Okay? So we know that it can be done. It's just a question of whether the government does it. Now, if your government turns out still to be neoliberal, obviously they're not going to do it. Okay, they're going to wait for the confidence fairy to come back and to produce recovery. So obviously, no, this is not going to happen. And as I said, this is one of the reasons which I have never said, I have not said anything about the recovery so far, because politically, this is, no, as I say, I'm, I'm amusing myself. And there's nobody who is really, who is ever likely to listen to this or, or take it seriously. Because, you know, this is sort of the, the equivalent to Paul Romer, who comes on with his, his uh, solution to the crisis. Test everybody every week. And you say, oh, that's interesting. We haven't managed to test anybody so far. The government is absolutely uninterested in testing anybody. And we don't have the capacity to produce the test. So fine, you know, you have a program which says we can recover tomorrow if we test everybody every week and we know who is contaminated and who isn't. And you say, yeah, okay. Now, if we had a different president, maybe that would happen. But sorry, I mean, this, these sorts of proposals, are, as I say, they're just making yourself happy. Uh, but they have absolutely no political traction. So the difficulty you've got is, you know, my response is yes, it can be done. But if there's, first of all, if there's no uh, political basis for doing it, uh, you take what you can get. And if taking what you can get is you know, giving tons of money to employers in order to pay their management stock option salaries, and maybe you end up with some preservation of employment, you say, okay, I'm, 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 happy. I'm happy with that, okay, because this is, you know, it's not that we take second best, this is 19th best or 20th best, but it's better than nothing at all, which what seems to have been the initial response, okay? Had it not been for the pressure of uh, the Democratic uh, House of Representatives, uh, the federal government would have done nothing. I mean, you, we, we saw the response of the, the, what was supposed to be the emergency response stockpile of the U.S. government. And the response was, this is our stockpile, not the people's stockpile. The government gets to keep it. You don't, if you want to use it, this is somehow or other going against the, the idea of having a stockpile. This is sort of like Roy Herod's idea of you know, having a, an international system in which you always have reserves. He gave this idea that you know, you, this, is, this is like having a, uh, a cab rank in which you always have to have three cabs in the rank, which means that if you come to the cab rank and there's three cabs, you can't get a cab. So you say, what's the use of having a cab rank with a reserve of three cabs if you can never, if you can never get a cab rank? Okay, so this this was the condition that we were sort of in. We had a federal government. The federal government was supposed to do something, but they said, no, this is not. It's not our job. We have to be ready to respond. Okay, uh, I'd go on too long. Okay, um, 
second, MMT and, and all of this stuff. Again, this is, yeah, if this is a, a real problem, not a financial problem, okay? Like I said, it doesn't make any difference whether you believe or you don't believe in MMT. It doesn't make any difference if you believe in debt or you don't believe in debt. This is a case of having to deal with, a, a, yeah, to fix a real problem. And the finance part of it is not the, the difficulty. Now, as I said before, the finance problem eventually will come back, and it always does. And whenever you get a substantial increase in government indebtedness, you get some political party who comes back, takes control, and then decides that you've got to repay all of that debt. And how do you repay that debt? Well, you repay that debt by cutting down on expenditures. So going forward and say, okay, we're going to open up. But the first part of that opening up, as I said, it's going to be a federal response towards reducing expenditures and the problem of solving the state budget problem. So it's at that, it's at that stage. Now, once, once we're through the, the crisis that we have to, we have to, uh, we have to respond. And that's why I said it would have, it would have, uh, from my point of view, it would have been more appropriate to try and do this without increasing indebtedness. And I think we could, as I say, part of this proposal is that we could have done that. Okay. Now this comes to the next part of the uh, of the problem, and that is the question: is you know, what if everybody is at subsistence? Okay. Well, that's fine. If everybody is at subsistence, you're back again to organize. Okay. This sort of uh, this sort of food support. And what do you need to do now is, again, you have to have the organization. Remember I said, you, you know, Roosevelt had the CCC, which was the, the, the first one, which was the Conservation Corps. Right? Basically, they went out and planted trees. Well, instead of going out and planting trees, you go out and you plant carrots. And you make sure that the carrots get to the people who need the carrots. Okay? So if you have the, the problem of provisioning, then you organize that through the provision of employment to those people who do not have it. And you provide them with that basic subsistence. Now, this does create a problem. It creates a problem, why? Because going back to normal means that you've got people who are going back to deficiency in terms of, of provisioning. And this is why we say when, you know, when we come out of this crisis, presumably, we should have some sort of responses. This is why I said, if, you know, if there's a question that people don't want to go back to work because unemployment benefits are higher than their wages, then maybe the response is to have higher wages rather than getting rid of the unemployment benefits. So that if they starve to death, they have to go back, uh, they have to, go back to work. So that basically, okay, if, you, if you think of it, think of it this way, we're all used to, looking at our circular flows, okay? We know that every income is an expenditure, okay? And it doesn't, from my point of view, what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't make any sense just to deal with some expenditures and not others. It doesn't make any sense to deal with some costs and not others. So that, you now, if I'm an employer and I say, well, you know, I have these tremendous costs in employing people. and say, well, you know, if you fire them all, you don't. Now, why do I need to bail you out? What's the problem? And you say, well, you know, I have uh, fixed costs. Say, okay, you've got fixed costs. Then we suspend those fixed costs. Okay, somebody sold you something, or I don't know. For example, it turns out that a large proportion of the small business sector in the U.S. works on uh, the basis of leasing. Okay, they don't buy capital equipment; they lease the equipment. Okay. So I have the lease payments that I have to make. Otherwise, I lose the I lose the oven in the restaurant, or I lose whatever it is. Say, okay, I recognize that. There's somebody who holds that lease. Okay, who is it? Okay, there's some financial institution who is expecting to get that to get that lease payment. You say, well, to the financial institution, you say, look, the value of that lease was I don't know, ten million dollars yesterday. Today, Mr. COVID-19 came along and Mr. COVID-19 put a haircut on that lease. It's not worth 10 million anymore. It's now worth 9 million. Okay. 
sorry, you take the capital loss and the restaurant owner now doesn't have to pay the lease for two months, three months or whatever it takes to come back. So this is what we're saying is that if you cut every one of the payments, okay, then what you're left with is just keeping people alive, which is presumably what the objective is. The objective is to make it possible for everybody not to go to work and not to go through their relative uh, in relative consumption expenditures over time for that period. Now, again, this is politically, this is something which is difficult to sell. People have to recognize that if you, you know, if you look at the way the economy works, you're going to say, well, you know, if I can, if I can go back to work, okay, then everything's going to be fine. And you have to say, no, it's not. Because if you go back to work and you contaminate people, okay, demand is going to go down anyway. Okay, the consumers are going to die, number one. Secondly, the consumers are not going to consume. Okay, they're going to be protecting themselves. Okay, and we're back to, you know, this basic simple fallacy of composition which is what makes you tear your hair out with these guys who say well all we have to do is open up and the economy is going to go back again and say okay fine you go back to work produce as much as you want but if nobody's there to buy it you now what are you going to do you're going to lose your job anyway okay you will have gone back to work you will have exposed yourself from being uh contaminated by the virus you expose yourself to the risk of death just in order to be able to say, now I preserve, well, I don't know what you're saying. I preserved my right to go out and work. Well, you preserve your right to go out and die. Fine. But that's not the way societies are supposed to function. In particular, when you're in a case in which, now you have to, to think of it this way. I mean, you know, we're just little, what are we, humanoid things. And here we have the little virus thing. And the virus things say, we do not like what you're doing. And what we're going to do is to colonize you. Okay? And that's what they do. Okay? So you have to decide. This is the, the, the same sort of thing between your, your what do you say, human independence and the colonizers. You're going to have to get rid of the colonizers. Now, we've done this before, and presumably we're going to have to do it again. But... As I said, as I, well, I think I'd be picked up. This is not something, not a battle we're going to win in the short term. And the epidemiologists, or whatever they're called, I cannot pronounce them, uh, are telling us is that even if we manage to get rid of this one, there is another one. Okay, if you follow the the uh, the science, okay, we now discover that. All of this business, remember, we have this famous Darwinian tree. Well, no, that's not the way this thing works, okay? Way back when, all of these little virus guys were there, okay? And they're an old, more or less an alternative line that have always, they've always been there. And in some cases, they did good things for us. And in some cases, they do bad things for us. But we're now just recognizing, number one, that they do they do do good things and also that they do do bad things okay so the question is whether okay whether whether or not you're able to convince people that it is in their interest to do this and, and again the, if you, you try to put it in this is you know this is sort of an exchange you're giving up two months or three months or whatever it is and the amount of benefit that you're getting back from this is is infinite infinite in what sense infinite in terms of the, the survival, okay? Because technically this little virus could wipe out a large proportion of the population if you don't do something about it, okay? So. All right. Uh, there are a couple of questions on the, the public health systems and, and health infrastructure. One is uh, Vikas. Yeah. Sorry, Vikas. Can I? Yeah. Sorry to yes, interrupt. I have now seen yeah. the questions that you oh, you yeah. sent me, and All I'm right. sorry I didn't see them okay. earlier. But there's one yeah. very interesting question, Jan, which I wanted to pick up on also. That you know, this basically you're saying you have to in this period you let everybody basic. It's like going to sleep almost. You put them in a, you let them sit at home and do nothing, and you allow essentials to work. What are essentials, right? That's the other critical thing because it's not just 
defining the essentials, but the input output relationships to produce the essentials. So in India, we found that, you know, the food, the packaging people were not around and the, therefore they ran out of packaging. So they couldn't make them in, in cell. Then you need fertilizer for the, for, for the farming. You need bandages for the medicine and so on and so forth. So in other words, the input output relationships are complex. So how do you define the essentials? Yeah, this is, well, again, I'm going back to this CCC business, okay? Mm -hmm. if, if you recognize that you've got the problem, okay, if you, you specify, you say, okay, what do I have to do? I have to make sure that I get provisioning. And you look at that particular, you know, the provisioning problem. It doesn't take a great deal of, uh, what do I say, intelligent or good sense to recognize that you're going to have disruptions in the supply system. Okay? And this is the first thing that you have to do. Second, well, my first or second, it doesn't make much difference. The other side of it is the uh, public health system. Okay? Because these are the two things. You've got, you know, you have people that you have to provision. And these are the people you're, as you're saying, you're putting to sleep, you're moving them off. On the other hand, you've got the people who are ill that have to be treated. And you need the support for that. And that's your health system. So that's the second system that you need. Now, some countries already have it. And it's now it's simply a question of scale, whether you can scale up or the degree to which uh, the virus, in fact, spreads. Okay? So these are the, the two basic essentials that you need. Beyond that, there's going to be a seg, the, I don't know what you want to call it, the investigation or the science sector or whatever, okay? And these are people who are not frontline uh, in terms of mitigation. These are people who are not frontline in terms of provisioning. These are people who are frontline in terms of looking at the medical response, okay? Vaccine production in, you know, calculus, whatever the, the, the scientists guys do in order to, uh, to eventually understand how the things work, okay? And basically those are the only three things you need in order to survive. Everything else sort of disappears. You say, well, you know, we have this government sector. Well, I mean, there are large proportions of the population that can still work while they're at home, okay? And these are people you really don't, you know, you don't worry about. Why do you worry about me? I mean, the fact that I'm, you know, I'm not meeting with the students anymore, I sit here and talk to the screen. Uh, you know, has a, a, a zero net impact, okay, in terms of whether I'm an essential or a non-essential worker. You don't have to worry about, you, know, you don't have to worry about me. Same thing is presumably true for the government. The government can function probably without having direct, uh, without having direct support. So the only thing that, that I have to have, and this comes to this, you know, the interconnection business, Somehow or other, you have to have somebody that makes sure that all of this electronic stuff works, okay? Because that's that's how we manage to get the work at home people uh, out of the story. Otherwise, we'd have to take care of them as well. But you know, the 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 net benefit or loss. I mean, I'm sure my students are much worse off uh, having to sit at home uh, playing some games while they see me on the screen than if they were actually sitting in a room with their computers playing the games, looking at me uh, first, because you know, there, is a, a, you know, there is some sort of interaction that is much easier when you have people. But for most of, the, uh, most of these activities, uh, people I've talked to discovered that you know, basically I can get all the work that I need to do done in two or three hours, and the rest of the time I have, if I've got kids, available to actually teach the kids because this is the other area which I didn't touch, but in which you know, uh, in the US we have an absolute disaster in that the public school systems simply are unable to respond to uh, this idea of online teaching simply because they don't have the, uh, the funds and they don't have the, uh, the equipment to do so. Think, for example, my daughter sits here, she meets with her teacher twice a week Monday and Fridays for a half an hour. And all the rest of the stuff is you know, stuff that she does by herself at home without a, 
without a teacher. And this is considered to be one of the better public school systems in, in the state. So this is, you know, this is something that you, you might want to include along with your essential, uh, with your essential workers because basically what we're doing is dumbing down the population incredibly rapidly or putting it in a different way, giving a tremendous benefit to those parents who can afford to send their kids to private school that uh, apparently do do five days a week, five hours a day, direct person-to-person -person contact between the pupils and, uh, and the teachers. They have classes normally the way You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, so. sorry, I said because sorry, you had some questions which I yeah, no, you no, so, so, yeah. so uh, yeah, there's a, a couple of questions on the health care system. Uh, one is uh, how do you see the idea of Obamacare in the context of COVID-19 situation and consequences of its dilution? Uh, what do you think about health insurance and presence of private dominated health care system in the, in, in the United States? And uh, 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 more generally, uh, what would be the implications of your alternative in a context in which public health infrastructure is, is poor? How does that change the, 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 the argument? Yeah, okay. I mean, the, the first one is, is quite obviously that part of getting your uh, your replication rate, your R factor down, is making sure that people who are in fact ill are treated, okay? And if you have a private system in which there are people who do not have coverage and cannot afford coverage, it means that it makes it that much more difficult in order to reduce that R factor. It means you're leaving people who are uh, contagious in the population and they're continuing to infect people. So not having full health insurance coverage that is available to everybody simply increases the cost of the entire, uh, the entire period. So you can, you know, you can, I would, I would say you can probably draw a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, health insurance coverage for the entire population and the amount of time that it takes to get your R factor down to some sort of, uh, manageable level okay so it's a an, an overall cost and this is again a, a very straight cost benefit deal it would be i'm sure much cheaper in order to provide full health coverage to people rather than allowing the private sector to simply provide it and to have people who continue to exist who are not covered and this is a i think a relatively straightforward argument now how you do that I don't know. There are all sorts of different ways. I mean, the UK, you have the National Health Service. Uh, European countries have coverage, but it's coverage which is done in a sort of quasi-public, uh, quasi-public way. I, don't know, I remember when I taught in uh, in Belgium, I was covered by a health insurance, but the health ins it was the health insurance which was obligatory, uh, but it was operated by uh, the equivalent of an NGO. A, a, a religious organization. I can't remember now exactly what, uh, which one it was. So, you know, there are all sorts of different ways of organizing this, but the point is that it has, it has to be available. You can't have it. You can't have a system in which people don't seek treatment because they, uh, they can't afford it. Now, obviously, the easiest way to do it is what in the U.S. we call single payer, that is having everybody covered by, uh, by the U.S. government. And if you understand the principles of insurance, you understand that this is, in fact, yes, the cheapest and the most efficient way to do that. Now, that then means that the health system has to be independent in some sense from the political budgetary process, okay? It doesn't make any sense to have a healthcare program, but if you starve it to death so that it can't function, then it really doesn't serve that purpose. And this is part of the difficulty that you have in, uh, in England in terms of the National Health Service, okay? So that you know, if, you don't, if you don't allow a sufficient funding for the, for the service and you allow the private sector to compete, 
then by definition, what you're saying is that I'm going to have the uh, optimal solution, but it's going to provide suboptimal uh, support, healthcare support. Okay. So that's, I think, relatively, no, it's relatively straightforward. And again, this is a, it's not so much a question of whether you think the public or the private is more, uh, more efficient. Okay, private provision may be efficient. It's in terms of the question. The question is in terms of coverage, of how you provide uh, how you provide that coverage. Now, as I say, uh, from the from the point of view of efficiency, obviously a public program is the is the most efficient one. Uh, but this is a, the question of, of political uh, political choice. Um, and that, yeah, I think that covers Obamacare. Obama, the problem with Obamacare is that Obamacare was also one of these, how should I say, uh, cripple programs in which you tried to combine the public and the private sector in a way that made both of them happy and ended up providing a service which was not relatively, uh, not relatively efficient. But again, it was better than nothing. Okay, I mean, health. Health insurance we've been trying to introduce in the U.S. since Roosevelt. Roosevelt decided it was too difficult to try. Harry Truman tried it, and well, ever ever since Harry Truman tried it, basically what has happened is that you created this massive uh, uh, private sector response, such that every time you get any sort of uh, any sort of idea towards public provision you get a, a, a political response rather than a medical or an economic response to the, to the kinds of programs that you should, uh, you should want. Okay, now you, you've got me started on public health insurance. The other one was, again, the, the, the efficiency of the public health service. And again, this is a, uh, it's a question that if you look at all of, I say, all of the standard uh, development literature, what do we say? Well, no, we say development is determined by what? It's determined by education. We have to have education. And in general, we don't spend any money at all on education in the countries that are trying to develop. It's in terms of having a efficient and skilled labor force, efficient and skilled labor force requires some sort of public health system, and we don't spend any money on public health system. So what do you have? You have this very nice conflict that always occurs between a country dealing with a IMF or a World Bank program in which you have the financial conditions that have to be met and the public health and other conditions which enter into, uh, which enter into the conflict. So this is a, a question for uh, objectives in terms of developing countries. I mean, we have enough uh, evidence, for example, in, in Africa for example, of HIV programs that end up being stalled because the funding for the program ends up increasing the expansion either of the fiscal deficit or the money supply of the country above the norms that they've agreed with the IMF for their bailout program so that the government ends up canceling the, uh, canceling the domestic program in order to meet the conditions on the on the IMF program. Okay. Now, in this case, you say, okay, well, the problem is that our our uh, our health system is inefficient. It's not sufficient. It's not uh, good enough in order to respond to these sorts of crises. And you say, yeah, that's probably right. But it's a problem of the kinds of objectives that you're going to be setting in terms of uh, in terms of the development program. Okay. Is it better to have a, I don't know, a 5% inflation rate rather than a 10% inflation rate uh, if the difference is in terms of setting up HIV clinics? Something, something like that. No. As we know, uh, I don't know, Jack, is Rick still in, in India or not? No. Uh, he's back in the US. He's working for uh, Bretton Woods Project, I think. Or is oh, okay. it on anyway, global financial Rick, integrity? Global financial integrity in, anyway, in Washington. Rick has written enough on this now. 
yeah. uh, in terms of the conflict yeah. between what do I say financial indicators and and public health and other expenditures exactly. mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to indicate that part of the problem is not so much that the public that the public health uh, sectors. You know, hold on just one second. One second. Hello. Hi, Russ. You can you can do that. I'm on an online right now, so I've got to hang up. But yes, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, but this was a, a maintenance a maintenance call that I that we need at the house, and I yeah. did not want to lose the guy. But because getting essential guys, service. <laughs> Essential yes. service. <laughs> services. Yeah. Okay, now, Vikas, remind me where I was. Or would, had we gotten through the, no, we were talking about Rick. That's what we were doing. That's yeah, right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I find it difficult to say, yeah, well, our, you know, our health systems are not sufficiently strong to do this. You know, the question is, why is that? Uh, because you're not spending enough money to do it. Why are you not spending enough money? Well, it's not big, well, part of, Partially, okay, uh, the national income is not sufficiently high in which people are willing to dedicate the appropriate proportion of national income for those expenditures, but it's also in part due to the fact that the external funding that you get for these things oftentimes is blocked by uh, these very strange sort of regulations on what governments are and are not uh, allowed to do with. Okay, uh, I think we have run out of our time officially. Yes, Vikas, is that true? Yeah, I think. Yeah, yes, yeah, what can I tell you? You know, this was absolutely fascinating. I feel like I've been pushed into a sort of cold water bath so I've made to look at things clearly. And uh, it, <laughs> it <laughs> makes you realize that we, we also think that we are being uh, different and we tend to take for granted a lot of the things which are probably not uh, which we shouldn't be doing. So I'm glad you pared it down to its essentials. We have to think more about this and we have to, uh, we, uh, this is of course still, uh, what's happening in the US is still so much better than what's happening in India that we're still jealous, even though of course I grant you everything that you've said. But um, I, wish, I wish it could be a little less depressing in terms of what you're suggesting, which is that the political configurations are more or less uh, likely to make things worse in the in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, this is well. I mean, if you if you look at it that way, I mean, I remember back in when this is end of January, February, we had to make a we had to take a decision on the Minsky conference. Are we going to have it or not? And you know, my first response was no. And inside the Institute, we had a certain amount of discussion. It was like, oh, you're too pessimistic and everything else. You know, how can you forecast this or everything and everything? And I said, look, I, mean, I don't have to be a forecaster. Okay. I don't have to be pessimistic. I just have to know who's running our government. And I have to know that this thing is incredibly contagious. So yeah. that, you know, this is a, no, this is a no brainer. Yeah. Now, by the time we get to April, we're going to be in mm -hmm. deep trouble. And you know, you, you simply yeah. you now you look at the people who are holding the the controls, yeah. and it's not difficult to figure out what's what's likely to happen. So. Oh dear, and we know who's holding the controls in India, so we have even worse things to look That's forward right. to. You have you have you have and this is, and this is the other thing is that there are so many of these mini me's that are running around. I mean, yeah. you've got them in Latin America. I mean, you've got yeah. them in Brazil. You've got them in yeah. Colombia. You've got them in India. You've got them in uh, in the Philippines. So, you know, it's they. How should I say they they self reinforce. So, you know, if this you know, if this guy did it well, then I can do it, and it just becomes an it becomes a pandemic of okay. inefficiency. Well, let's hope that like this pandemic, that pandemic too will eventually pass. <laughs> but listen, thank you. That was amazing. That was really okay. Uh, thank that you. That was amazing. I, 
No, I should also thank you, Jati, because I, as I say, I've been stewing on this for a long time and, yeah. and saying I will not say anything. And then I thought, well, okay, and for Jati, I will do this. So. Thank you. In fact, I have to sit back and listen to it all again because I really want to go through that argument. It, it is so fresh. It's so novel, like the coronavirus, but it is actually something that we have to, we have to think about much more carefully and in detail. So we're going to do that. And, and thank you, thank you so much.